States. After serving as Evil Knievel's bodyguard in the early 70s, Sullivan began ministry training. Shortly thereafter, he created the Jump to Jesus program as an original way to preach the gospel. The king of Tonga happens to be a born-again Christian, and Sullivan will honor him by riding his motorcycle up a ramp through a ring of fire and over a series of cars. He hasn't performed in 13 years, but Sullivan hasn't lost his bearing. Well, you know, it's kind of like the last crusade when uh, Sean Connery gets shot and Harrison Ford is asked the question, you're going to have to really suck it up and see what you really believe in. I guess at 50, I'm going to have to see what I really believe in. Uh, I greet you from the United States, state of Montana, and uh, I am honored to be here this morning with uh, your majesties, your royal highness, princesses, royal family, diplomatic corps, honored and distinguished guests, pastors, and shepherds of God's flock. To begin, with uh, the message that the Lord has put on my heart, which uh, I don't know if you noticed me, but I didn't have a chance to eat <laughs> because <laughs> I never am able to eat at these things, you know. It's like going into the ring. I used to be a boxer before I knew Jesus. You'll have to forgive me. But uh, you don't fight before you go into the, or uh, eat before you go into the ring. And, I never am hungry, but afterwards I'm always hungry and they take the food away. I would like the ladies, uh, the New Life Singers, uh, led by my wife Cece, to sing a song before I bring the message. The shakings of the world that have gone on since the beginning of governments, the movies through the movies of time have always been nations being birthed and governments coming forth. At His Majesty's 79th birthday, and during this occasion, I think it's important to focus a little bit on this government, the governments represented, our government, the governments of the world, and I felt like I would start from the end and work toward the beginning of my message. The end of the matter is found in Revelations 11, verse 15, and it says, The seventh angel sounded, which is the last angel. There are seven vials and seven seals and seven trumpets and seven angels. And the seventh angel sounded, and there was a great voice in heaven, many voices, the scripture says. And the voices said, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And heaven responded 
and heaven said, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art, which was, and which art to come, because you have taken to thee your great authority, and you have reigned. That's the end of the matter. The end of the matter is that we are all pilgrims and soldiers in this life. Many times nations go to war and individuals go to war. And they go to war mostly because of covetousness and greed. Instead of becoming pilgrims and sojourners, instead of being stewards and caretakers, of what has been given to us by the Lord, we become owners and possessors. And we seek to grab and take and possess rather than have an attitude and a heart of thanksgiving and one of benevolence that seeks to give and to bless. In Isaiah, the eighth chapter, The prophet says, to the law and to the testimony of God should every man speak. And if they don't speak according to this word, it is because there's no light in their soul. There's no light in their spirit. And in chapter 9, the prophet gives us the forewarning and the blessing of the coming of the King of Kings, and he says in verse 6, Unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Notice it doesn't say governments, plural. It says the government. Because as the Father created the Son, and as the Son came to shower his grace and blessings, there really is only one government that comes from God. We know that there is the kingdom of darkness and there is the kingdom of light. But the one government, the omnipotent God, the beginning and the end, the Lord of all creation, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, whose name is Jesus Christ, is the ruler of the one government. And the scripture says that the government rests upon his shoulders. That when Jesus came, he came as the master of salvation, the physician of healing, and the doctor of deliverance. He came with love and grace and power and majesty. He came in simple clothing. He came riding on a donkey for his coronation, as it were. But he came as the potentate of an invisible government that could only be seen and experienced by those who received of his spirit in their spirit, which enlightens us to eternity. You know, it's a glorious thing this world that's been given to us in the many opportunities and the many facets of life. It's a glorious thing. But when your spirit is regenerated by the spirit of the living Christ, the resurrected Savior, the veil, as it were, begins to be lifted off of your heart and you begin to see eternity. You begin to realize that we are eternal beings. Thank God that we just don't live 70, 80, 90, 100 years in Paris and end up in the dust, never remembering or never advancing. And verse 7 says, of the increase of his government and peace. You see, he's not the Lord of war. He's the Lord of peace. Now true, the scripture says he'll come back and he'll do battle with wickedness and with darkness. But he is the Lord of peace. And of his increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. And his kingdom will be ordered and established with judgment, 
justice and righteousness forever and ever. And the zeal of the Lord will perform it. This morning, I want to speak to us a little bit about zeal. Some people mistake in me zeal for craziness. They say you're 50 years old and you're jumping a motorcycle over 15 cars through a burning wall. That's not zeal, that's craziness. But the question might be asked, why do I do that? Why does my son, of course, my son's 19, you would expect it from a 19-year-old. <laughs> but why do I do that? I do it for one reason. You see, early in my life, I was raised in a privileged family. My father was a very famous sports columnist in San Francisco. He had his own column for over 50 years. He was very well known. And I attained to Hollywood. I was a professional prize fighter for a short time. I tried out with the 49ers and the Raiders. I was doing TV commercials and trying to be rich and famous. And the man Jesus one morning encountered me at a breakfast, much like this, much smaller, insignificant little breakfast, but I came to that breakfast and I heard a man give a testimony. And he had been on drugs, he had been on heroin, and he said one night Jesus woke him up, spoke to his spirit, and said to the man, if you throw away your heroin, I will heal you and I will deliver you. I sat there, an Irish boy, a Catholic, who believed in the Lord Jesus, had a fear of God, but I never knew him personally. And, and when this skinny man said that Jesus spoke to him, my attention was fastened on this man. Because I, I had not believed that Jesus would speak to anybody but maybe a priest. And as I fastened my spirit on this man that was sharing a three-minute testimony, a prayer went from my spirit. And the prayer was this, Lord Jesus, would you speak to me? An involuntary prayer came from my heart. Lord Jesus, will you speak to me? Now you might say, yes, you were young and rash, uneducated, somewhat of a crazy man. I will admit to all those things. But I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, that that morning when I said that, the Spirit of the Lord came upon me and made me a new man. I bench pressed over 400 pounds. I had hair down on my shoulders. I wasn't one who would come in the presence of people and cry. But that morning I wept like a baby. For 45 minutes I cried. As the Spirit of the Lord dealt with my life, the sin in my life. And I went forward to a small gathering and four men laid hands on me just like in the Bible. And the Spirit of God came on me and I began to praise Him in an unknown tongue. Totally ignorant of the Scripture. Never read the Bible. I was born again I was filled with the Spirit of the living Christ, the resurrection Spirit. The same Spirit that rose Christ from the dead came upon me and it quickened me. And I became zealous for Jesus. I mean, I was dangerous for Jesus. <laughs> you see, my whole life was in the nightclubs, entertainment. Much drinking, and I was a professional bodyguard. So the only crowd that I knew was the entertainment bar crowd, the 
the very wealthy in the social strata of San Francisco. So what did I do with this newfound Jesus? I took him right into their midst. <laughs> and instead of drinking beer, I had 7-Up and orange juice. And instead of fighting, I cried. <laughs> That's a strange thing. They said, Gene, what in the world has happened to you? I said, I've been overcome by the love of God. Well, my friends separated themselves from me, but, and that was a good thing for a time because I went into ministry training for about five years. And one of my mentors, one of the instructors in my life was Derek Prince, who has a tremendous teaching ministry worldwide. And I consider Derek my, one of the fathers of my faith, precious man. And in 1978, the Spirit of the Lord came back on me and said, I want you to jump for me. I want you to pick up the motorcycle and I want you to go into the marketplace of this world. I want you to go where my gospel is not being preached and I want you to get on that bike and zealously ride for me. And I want you to share a simple testimony of your life. That's what I've been doing since 1978. <laughs> we never charge at our programs. Our programs are free. We never pass the hat. We don't solicit money, so you can rest easy. There won't be an offering after my message. The, the phenomena that I experience, ladies and gentlemen, is something that the Lord wants to make available to you here this morning that may never have experienced the resurrection spirit in your life. Because I'm not talking about becoming religious. I'm not talking about joining a church. I'm talking about becoming part of the family of God. And having a revelation come to you of his kingdom. Because as I read in the scriptures, one day all of this will come together. All the nations will submit to the Lordship of Christ. And after struggling and straining and fighting and warring and stealing and trying to make our own way for 6,000 years, we're going to have the opportunity to sit under the government of the King of Kings and we're going to see how it's done right. And all of us preaching the gospel and all of you that take finances and all the programs in the political world to the nations, you have an opportunity to be part of the right way of doing things. I have opportunity to be part of the right way of doing things. And there is an abundant grace that God has given us to walk in our calling. Whether you be a school teacher, whether you are a pastor, whether you are a business person. The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And he turns it wheresoever he will. I must say that this is my third visit to Tonga. And I must say that I have found it very easy to pray in Tonga. Very easy to read my scriptures. Very easy to be at peace in my soul and sit and commune with the Lord. Very easy. This is like coming to uh, um, somewhat of an R&R &R for us. Somewhat of a rest and recreation. Tonga probably is not known as the greatest recreation site in the world. But for us, it's very medicinal for our spirit. And I believe 
and I know that one of the reasons that we find peace here is because His Majesty, His Royal Highness, the Royal, many of the Royal Family, many of the distinguished people in government fear the Lord Jesus Christ and give honor to His name. And they have a heart to do the right thing because of the Lord and because of love for brothers. And do you know what a great spirit that genders over your islands? I don't know, maybe it's something you haven't thought about, but take it from a foreigner who is sensitive to the things of the spirit. It is very relaxing. It is very peaceful. It is very good. The prayer breakfast is something that was exhorted to Timothy by St. Paul in the Bible. He said in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, I exhort you therefore, first of all, that supplications and prayers and intercessions and the giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in godliness and honesty. And you know, many of those qualities are in this kingdom. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of our God and Savior, who will have all men to come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. For there is one God and one mediator, the man Jesus Christ. And you know, as I considered, I've been to many prayer breakfasts, governor's prayer breakfasts and and uh, from up to down in the United States. And really, the prayer breakfast is something that we should be very thankful for because in many nations of the world, they don't have such a thing and they're not interested in it. And I wanted to read to you a prayer that Paul, St. Paul, prayed for the Church of Ephesus. And this describes really my relationship with the Lord Jesus. He says in chapter 1, verse 15, it follows, Wherefore I also, Paul says, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the love that you have to all the saints, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Now here's what Paul prayed for the Ephesian church. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, would give to you the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation in the knowledge of Him. That the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. You see, it's one thing to have knowledge. It's another thing to have the revelation of the Holy Spirit. That you might know what is the hope of your calling. And what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? If you knew me personally, you would know that this morning and how I am in your presence is really no different than how I am with my wife or with my children or with the people in our ministry or when I'm alone with the Lord. When you have something of the resurrection spirit in your soul and marry your spirit, when the spirit of the resurrected Jesus is, is joined to your human spirit, it changes you from inside out. And it, it has within it the, the word that the scripture uses that the Greek uses is dynamite, dunamis. It's a power, it's a strength. There's, there's a scripture in Romans that says, if the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead dwell in you, remain in you, it will quicken your mortal body. It will even quicken your flesh. It has the potential to heal your diseases. To remove the confusion from your mind. 
whether you're a minister of finance or whether you're an ambassador to this nation, whether you are a shepherd of God's flock, a businessman, a, a housewife. What we need is we need the revelation of the Spirit. We need our minds quickened. We need our bodies healthy. The promise of this is in the Spirit of God. It's promised to us all. In closing, I would like to quote a scripture that talks of the kingdom of God. Jesus said, The kingdom suffers violence. The kingdom of God suffers violence. And violent men take it by force. The kingdom suffers violence and the violent take it by force. I pondered much on this scripture years ago. And through study and through prayer, I was given by the Spirit an interpretation that is not, I won't say this is the interpretation, but at least it is in part, and it is for me. The kingdom of heaven exists in the pressure and force of God's life-giving energy and emotion. And those who are forcefully energized by His Holy Spirit will seize it for themselves. You can watch CNN most any day of the week. And there's some group of people in some nation of the world trying to seize authority in a government. Through human endeavor, through violence, through deceit, manipulation. But Jesus said, my kingdom exists in the pressure of my Father's life, keeping energy and emotion. And those who would penetrate my, my Father's kingdom, those who would enter the realm of revelation and come to a revelation of my kingdom, must be forcefully energized themselves. To enter his spiritual kingdom, you must be a spiritual man or a spiritual woman. And you must have the Spirit of Christ. It's a glorious thing. It's changed the lives of millions. That resurrection spirit caused our Lord to come out of that tomb to be seen by hundreds of men, to ascend to his Father's right hand, and his last message was, I go to prepare a place for you, so that you can be where I am with my Father. And he told his disciples to go back to Jerusalem and wait for the power. Pride will not apprehend this power. Self-strength won't apprehend it and money can't buy it. Intelligence cannot figure it out and knowledge cannot attain to this power. Jesus said, unless you come as a child, you cannot receive it. So I would like to close with a prayer. And maybe the girls could come and just softly play something. I would like to close with the prayer of St. Paul in the book of Ephesians, which I read. And I'd like to I'd like to pray for all of us. And I would like you to consider this morning, this is a prayer, prayer breakfast. This is a breakfast. 
that is honoring the Lordship of Christ. I, in many ways, I'm a missionary. I don't receive a salary, either from my ministry organization or from any other source. We live by faith. The reason I say this is that we're not here because we have money. We're not merchants. We're servants. If I had millions of dollars and you could benefit from my money, I would give it to you. I would. And, and the money that I, I've had, I have done that. I have given. And I know many of you have given also. I thought, this is His Majesty's 79th birthday. What Lord could I bring? What, and I, I prayed about this before coming. I, I said, Lord, what could I give this man? Because he's not just a king, he's also a man of God. What could I give him? And I looked around my house, and I really saw nothing that I felt that I could give to His Majesty. My wife is, is talented. She can make t-shirts and do sparkly things. And, and she can do things like that. But I can't. It would look very bad. And he would not only would he not wear it, he'd probably bury it. <laughs> but my son Wade, who will be jumping the motorcycle tonight, I will jump the last jump at the park for the parade, at the end of the parade. I will do the last jump, and my son Wade will do the jump tonight. My son said to me, Dad, you don't have any silver or gold. You have nothing precious to give His Majesty, but you do have the gift of God giving that. And I'm reminded of St. Peter and John walking to the temple at the hour of prayer, and the poor lame man sitting, the beggar, sitting impotent in his feet, not able to stand, looking upon them as if they would give him something. And Peter looked down, fixed his eyes on him, and said, I have no money, but what I have I give you. Rise and walk. And the scripture tells us that that man stood to his feet. So what I have to give to your royal majesty and what I have to offer to distinguished guests is the resurrection spirit of the living God. I would like to pray. Lord of glory, Lord Jesus Christ, we honor you for this occasion. We have stepped aside from our busy lives to come this morning and to experience your presence in a short and maybe a, a very small way. To hear words of hope, music and melody of joy, and the word of God that can spark our spirits to eternity. Now, Lord Jesus, I ask that you would Release your spirit here this morning and that you would quicken us in our mortal bodies. Quicken us, Jesus, and give us the revelation of your kingdom. Enlighten us with your understanding. Let your resurrection spirit fall upon this gathering, I pray in Jesus' name. Now I want to say if there's any here that would like to receive of the resurrection spirit, just, just raise your hand to the Lord. 
Just raise your hand to the Lord and say, Lord Jesus, I want your resurrection spirit. That's that's all he's asking, if there's any here. Yes. Raise your hand. Let him see you. Raise your hand. Yes. 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 Jesus, who knows the hearts of all men and all women, grant the requests of these your children. And Lord, we look forward to the day of your return that we can look you in the eye and we can bless you. <coughs> Amen. Lord, it's my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the the water he my soul and guides my path in righteousness for his name's sake goodness and love Follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever. Of the shadow of death, I will not fear how I will be. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence. 